Margarita, how are you doing this morning? Good morning, Julia. Thank you so much for having me and for uh, this opportunity. And I'm, I'm very excited. Feeling well. How are you feeling? I'm doing really good, actually. Awesome. So I heard you read, wrote a book recently about hair loss. That sounds very interesting. So, um, so how exactly did your hair loss start? Okay, so in March of 2020, so around two years ago, I wound up getting COVID, got the virus, um, the original strain of it. So this was like not the Omicron, this was like the original COVID, which was killing people all over the world. I'm a healthcare worker in New York City, working in a nursing home. And um, the virus had really just hit my area. And I was like one of the first people to even really catch it like at my at my facility and I got really 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 sick I mean I I'm talking like pretty much every symptom out there I had I mean thank god I didn't need like a ventilator or anything but at that time you couldn't even get tested because they were just reserving testing for people on ventilators so it was a nightmare oh wow and yeah I mean I had like fevers um loss of taste and smell. Um, I had like elevated heart rate. Um, I had diarrhea. I had um, sore throat, massive headaches, weakness. I couldn't get out of bed. I, I would say I was, I was sick for about um, like a month and a half before I really can say like, okay, I'm, I'm better. So I was sick for quite some time. Um, so that was March of 2020. And so the way that my hair fall began is June of 2020. So exactly three months later, you know, I'm, I'm good. Like, I'm fine. Um, my birthday um, is in June. So my boyfriend and I, you know, due to all the pandemic um, closures, we decided, you know what, for my birthday, we're going to drive down to Tennessee, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. We're going to do like a little camping road trip thing. Very excited. So we're driving down from New York to Tennessee and had the window rolled down. Um, I had my hair like in a braid or something, took the braid out. And I just began like finger combing like this, you know, or manipulating. And I looked at my hand and all of a sudden I saw like my hair just like all in my hand. And I was like, what? Like, what is happening? And then I kept on doing it. And then I kept on like throwing it out the window because I was like, ew, this is disgusting. Like my hair is like coming out. And then my boyfriend was like, stop, stop. What, what are you doing? Stop pulling your hair out. Like he thought I was pulling my hair out. And I was like, babe, no, I'm not pulling my hair out. It's falling out. Like it's coming out. Yeah. As we, it is falling out. And, um, but I didn't want to like cause a fight, like as we're, you know, on a lovely road trip. So I just kind of put it in a braid and tried to like ignore it for the rest of the camping trip. And I kind of thought, okay, as soon as I get home, I have to like, make sure I'm not just like delusional here <laughs> like you know what the heck is this so when I got home um again like I took a shower and it's just so much came out and then that lasted for a good three months but um during that time of course I went on Dr. Google like everyone does to Google hair loss like you know post-COVID and at that time not a whole lot was coming up because like this was still very early in the pandemic but um, I did read of a, t a condition called telogen effluvia, which is kind of like a stress-related temporary hair loss where people after a stressor such as a illness, like a viral illness or any other type of illness, fevers, um, like a death in the family, like an emotional trauma, physical trauma, after a surgery, after an accident, your hair can temporarily inappropriately go into the telogen or kind of like shedding phase. And then um, it, you know, it usually does self-resolve, but what people don't realize is it can reoccur. Like it can wind up being a chronic condition, meaning it's more than three months or it just can reoccur. And um, so at that time, I just kind of said, you know what, it sounds like Dr. Google is telling me that there's something I can do about it. Just wait it out. It'll go away. And which it did. So um, exactly for three months, the hair was shedding like a dog. But I just kind of tried to like, you know, like not look like I'm looking you know, like on my wash days, like they were very traumatic, but I just tried to like, you know, you not like, look and then just whatever hair came out, grab it, throw it in the toilet, just, you know, not look. Um, 
and then I got through it, you know, and I just kind of thought, oh, thank God that's done. That's over with. Um, and I just thought I don't have to really like think about it ever again. Um, and I did wind up going at that point to a dermatologist just because it's just out of curiosity. Like, I just wanted to see what would he say? Like, is he going to give me something or is he going to say like anything? Um, so I did go to one and he basically just dismissed me. Like, you know, I walk in, he's like, oh, you're fine. Like, you don't look like you have a hair loss problem to me. And he didn't do a scalp examination. He didn't even look at my scalp. He just, um, like I brought in a bag of hair and he just said, ah, it, it, it'll go away on its own. You don't have to do anything. Oh, gee. And I had like a sunburn at the time. So I more so came in for the sunburn. So he treated like the sunburn, but he didn't care so much about the hair. So, um, and then I did have some labs run through my general practitioner. I did mention the hair loss to her and she also dismissed it basically just saying like, oh, it could be your, um, your thyroid because I do have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune thyroid condition where you're, like your own immune system over time uh, gradually attacks your thyroid. Um, but they, they pretty much dismissed it as well because um, the problem is if you're like a woman and you walk in with um, on presentation a fairly decent head of hair, they're not going to panic over your situation. Um, if you have alopecia areata, which is like the patchy hair loss, like that's like the size of like a quarter and it's like on your head like that, they will pay mind to that because that's very, very visible. But if you just come in with bags of hair and say, hey, guys, my hair is falling out, they probably won't really care too much. Um, so the reason why I decided to write the book is because at that time of um, my telogen effluvium situation post-COVID, there was very little information out there. The little information that I saw, um, some of them are just saying, oh, um, put some oil on your head or put some coffee on your head or put some garlic on your head. Like, you know, like all these like homemade remedies or take biotin, take some biotin gummies. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I tried everything. I tried a laser helmet, which I wound up buying on eBay. Oh, I've seen that. that laser helmet. Yeah, like I tried that. And that actually made the hair fall even worse, I think, because it it speeds up like your hair cycle. So like whatever was going to fall out, it just all fell out like the next day. So it like I, I do recommend if you are dealing with like a hair fall issue, avoid the laser helmet because it just might speed up. Your psychologist will dismiss a hair loss condition unless it is blatantly like glaringly obvious. So. Um, that's like the number one reason why I just wanted to write my book. And my book is called Telogen Effluvium Warrior. You can find it on Amazon uh, to be downloaded onto the Kindle. If you have like um, the um, Amazon Kindle, like unlimited membership, you can even read it for free. But basically, I just talk about kind of like, like step one, like what to do first. Like if you are experiencing post-COVID hair loss, um, then this is like the first thing you should do. And I just described that in my book. And I will just tell, tell you guys right now, the first thing you should do is go to, go to Google, Google dermatologist near me and try to find like five different dermatologists in your area that take your health insurance. Because I think the problem is a lot of women, they're like, oh my God, my hair is coming out like post COVID. And they, they try too many just like do-it-yourself remedies, too many DIYs. I mean, people are putting garlic on their head. People are putting onion juice on their head and coffee on their head. And they think that's going to stop their hair loss or they're binging on like biotin gummies, <laughs> you know, and things like that. And they, you know, and then they're like, and it's not stopping the problem. And I mean, honestly, hair loss in, in general, anytime your hair just suddenly starts falling up, it is a very complex issue. And it's not even just like, you know, the first dermatologist you go to is going to necessarily have the answer. So when you look on their webpage, make sure that they specialize um, in alopecia, which is like the general term for hair loss. It doesn't mean that like all alopecias are the same. Um, and you also want to make sure that like if they don't, maybe they have other people in their clinic that maybe they do take more of a focus on hair loss. Um, you can even call their office and ask them. 
Um, and then the reason why I say write down like five different names is because like I went to like two different ones, two or no, I actually went to three different ones. I'm sorry. One, actually my friend who had telogen effluvium and she got treated by this one guy. She she referred him to me, and so I went thinking, oh, he'll 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 treat me because <laughs> he treated yeah. her. And then he dismissed me. <laughs> you know? so, so yeah, so that's why I say like write down the names of like at least five because and don't be disappointed if like the first couple you go to just dismiss you. Um, you really have to advocate for yourself, and you really just have to um, you know, ask for a scalp evaluation ask for maybe even a scalp biopsy, like if you're really concerned, you know, about that, ask for some blood work, um, go to your general practitioner, ask for blood work, ask to, for them to check for like autoimmune markers and things like that, because um, the immune system really does play um, a role in, in hair loss. And it, it is very complex and it's very delicate. There's so many different things that could go on. You could have like a nutritional deficiency. I found out I was vitamin D deficient. I, like, I didn't know because I take a multivitamin. So I, I had all those gummies would have you covered, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, and I do, I take stuff. And, um, you know, and at that time, like I was taking so many different like over the counter, like hair vitamins and things like that. And it was still falling, but I guess it's like psychologically, <laughs> like you feel like you're doing something for yourself. But um, mm -hmm. women really just need to know that they have to advocate for themselves and just eventually, you know, you will find someone that can help you, but just don't give up. Um, that's why I called the book Telogen Effluvium Warrior, because it really is like a battle. Like it really is really painful to just day after day, just see your hair like in your food, on your clothes, on your car seat, on your carpet, clogging the shower drain. Um, the breaking point for me, because like I didn't think that my condition was all that bad because most people didn't notice it. But one time I was um, working with a, a patient and then I had another patient, like a resident, like walk behind me. And he was like, oh, you got a bald spot right there. You should put oh. something on it. And oh. I was mortified because like, he oh. said it in, in the room, like full of people. Yeah. And I must have turned like bright red. But I just like ignored it, pretending like it didn't upset me. But I came home and I'm like examining my scalp. And I was like, oh, my God. But at that time, I was oiling my hair so much because like, you know, everything you read, tells you oh oil your hair oil your scalp like do this do that yeah. so I was coming to, yeah and so I was like coming to work with like a very oily greasy head which kind of revealed probably more of my you know when your hair is greasy and oily yeah you, you know, you tend to, exactly so I think that was part of like what made it like look a little bit worse um but nevertheless like it was such a blow to my confidence and then I became like really you know my self-esteem took such a beating like um, I actually even did go out and get a wig only because I really did think I was going to go bald. Like, I really did think I was going to lose enough of my hair that I won't even be able to go to work because it would be like that bad. Thank God, like, it, it didn't get to that point And I did wind up, you know, selling the wig. But like, you know, I was like on that level where I did not know what direction this whole thing would go in. And that's another reason why I wrote the book because I want um, people to not freak out, like have some guidance, like have a kind of step-by-step -step thing on what to do first and then what to do for maintenance. Because once your hair does re resolve and once it does stop falling out, you need to maintain yeah, yeah. a good care because unfortunately it can be reoccurring. Um, you know, it may stop now, but maybe in a year from now, you might have surgery and it could happen again, or maybe you, you could have a death in the family, it could reoccur from that. So you just really need to know like, hey, I, I have this susceptibility, this vulnerability to this condition. Um, I need to know like step A, B, C, like what to do for it. And a lot of people don't know that there are stuff you can do for it. I mean, I didn't know, like I kind of I, found out the hard way. Yeah, you know? I think the general public knows. And luckily you have a nursing background, so you're able to advocate for yourself. So I think your book will be helpful for people that are lost and somebody tells them, oh, you're okay. Yeah, I mean, th there are just so many different um, factors like that 
do play a role in it. And it's not even just like a one size fits all. And that's why you just really need to have like a good team of people on your side that are that are savvy in it and that are willing to kind of, you know, explore exactly what is wrong with you, why is this happening and what can be done. Um, you know, just because you had COVID and now the hair is falling out, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to suffer with it and take it like there are things that you can do. And the other thing I did want to mention is 99% to 100% of dermatologists will probably tell any of their patients experiencing this to go to CVS and get some Rogaine. Oh. And, you know, minoxidil. And that is what I was told like three times. And I did it because when you are desperate, when you are losing your hair and, you know, there is no end in sight, you will do whatever that <laughs> dermatologist tells yeah, you to do. Exactly. And, you know, yeah. And it's like after you FDA approved, it's been around for quite some time. And, you know, the before and after pictures on some of the testimonials are pretty promising. So, you know, you, you run to the store, you buy that Rogaine, like you don't care and you try it. But um, the, my problem is I, I, I was like allergic to it. I couldn't tolerate it. It's, it's actually invented originally for people who have high blood pressure and I have low blood pressure. And so I was told by my doctor, oh, that's OK. It, it won't lower your blood pressure. But for me, it did. It, it, my blood pressure dropped to 80 over 50. Like the top number was 80, like, you know, the top number is supposed to be like 120 over 80 and mine dropped to 80 over 50. It dropped really dangerously, low. dangerously low. Very low. And it made my heart like race, like in compensation, because when your blood pressure drops that low, your heart kind of speeds up to pump the blood like upward. It was very dangerous for me. Um, another thing that the Rogaine did is it made my scalp late. And it just, uh, it has like a high alcohol content, Rogaine. Oh, interesting. Um, and like, because I don't wash my hair every day, I typically wash it like once or twice a week. And so at that time, I would apply the Rogaine in the morning and then I would apply it again at night, like they said too. Yeah. And then after a couple of days, I have like these flakes, like, I don't know if it was like dandruff or literally my my skin just drying and flaking off, but it was nasty. Um you know, and irritation and, and things like that. So um, both, uh, you know, systemically as well as topically, I just did not like the Rogaine experience. And after a very short period of time, like, you know, maybe a couple of days I used it at the most, like up to a week and I had to stop. Um, you know, it just was not working for me but this I don't know because a lot of people might have similar side effects and they'll be like, Oh, but I was told to do this. And then they're going to yeah. be confused. Yeah. I mean, even if like my blood pressure, like, cause like, and then I told the dermatologist, I said, look, you know, my blood pressure dropped to 80 over 50. I don't think I'm a candidate for this. And he even told me to continue. He said, Oh no, that's okay. He said, just put it on at night. That way you don't have to worry about your blood pressure dropping. Don't put it on during the day, put it on at night while you sleep. And I'm thinking, all right, so I'm going to be sleeping and have like really low blood pressure while I sleep. You know, that didn't kind of make sense to me. Oh, that's not good. Wow. And then he was like, oh, maybe your body will eventually like kind of like adjust and adapt. And, and I, was like, I don't want to, I don't want to experiment and see. No, I don't if think you want to go there. Yikes. No, no. <laughs> like that just did not, that did not sound right to me. Um, so I knew that that was not going to be on my arsenal or repertoire, oh. uh, you know, hair regrowth. Um, one thing I that I did get is a supplement called uh, Nutrafol. I actually have it here. Oh, um, that's cool. And yeah, and I have um, been looking into this uh, quite a bit. And there's a lot of really good research behind this. And the reason why... Um, it, it, it's expensive. It's like $88. So it's definitely not cheap. But when you're losing your hair and you, you know, you a Rogaine, a Rogaine yeah. is also not cheap. Yeah, you'll do anything. So I just recently started using this. And the reason why I like it is because it does address inflammation. It has like um, turmeric, like curcumin, um, anti-inflammatory, um, you know, substances, uh, salt palmetto in it, which is like a DHT reducer. And DHT is like a hormone that can facilitate hair loss. Um, it has just so many different things in it that help reduce inflammation in the body. And inflammation is like that um, skeleton in the closet that no one talks about. Like inflammation has such a role in this hair fall condition. 
And that was why I was so impressed with Nutrafol because this is really the only supplement that I saw that really kind of addresses the inflammatory uh, issue behind uh, hair loss related conditions. Um, you know, most people just think, oh, let me pop a gummy, let me pop a hair bear, you know, like those blue Kylie Jenner <laughs> promoted <laughs> things. And then they think that the problem oh, will go away. But, but this sounds you know, a little bit more um, research backed, actually, the one that you yeah. Yeah, like this is um, physician formulated. It's clinically shown to increase hair growth and improve the hair quality in women. It's drug free. Also, this has ashwagandha in it, which is an adaptogen that helps your body kind of like adapt to stress. And stress is obviously, you know, plays a role in um, hair fall as well. Um, it has zinc, it has um, iodine, hydrolyzed marine collagen. Um, so like if you're if you're like you want to you know if you're like a strict vegan and you avoid anything with fish products this is this has like marine collagen so it, it's it not like to regrow your hair i think this might be something to look into that's what yeah I think yeah um it has like um amino acids like cysteine lysine methionine hydrolyzed um oh, so solubilized keratin which you know our hair is made of keratin so this is like very comprehensive. I, I I really just started it. So it's like really too soon for me to say if it did anything for me or not, but I'm really excited to see um, if I, it helps me kind of like keep my hair growth, you know, going and things like that. Yeah. Um, but there's just a lot of good research behind that product. Uh -huh. um, but it, it does take a while to kind of see. It's like a four month type of commitment. So maybe but, in a few months we'll hear an update from you on Instagram yeah. or YouTube. That would be kind of neat to see. Yeah, sure. In a couple of months. Yeah. yeah. But um, basically the bottom line is just like once you go to your dermatologist, once you kind of get treatment from them, then you just have to maintain it. So what happened to me is my condition actually wound up reoccurring because my job uh, mandated or required me to get uh, something in, into my arm that I didn't want to get but I had to get it to keep my job and then I about that. yeah so I don't really want to get in trouble for saying too much but basically I, I I had to get something got it done and then I wound up having um an adverse reaction which required hospitalization unfortunately um and I wound up having um a severe severe uh like allergic reaction and um unfortunately that illness from from this caused the telogen effluvia oh, to come unfortunately and reoccur only this time instead of falling for three months my hair fell for eight months so wow. when you combine the eight month loss with the three month loss that's 11 months of hair loss that i experienced you know that's interesting because i i haven't had like severe hair loss but i will tell you when i got the <laughs> i lost some hair i noticed that i thought that was yeah yeah and i think a lot of women did but they're it's not spoken about like I just think that people are attributing it to stress or they think it's because of their job or they think it's because of the weather or they think it's because they didn't sleep enough but you know I'm, I'm hearing more and more because if you think about it if you had like let's say a fever after this or if you um, felt fatigued after it or if you had anything going on after it then that's changing the infl inflammation levels in your body and like i said hair fall is very closely linked to the immune system and inflammation in your body and i would be i would be very surprised if people got this once twice three times and and their hair was completely completely fine i mean they're very lucky but most people are probably going to experience some degree of increased inflammation and shedding you know, after. And for me, as like a highly sensitive, chemical sensitive person, it was like such a whammy on my system. And um, then it fell for eight months instead of three oh, months. Yeah. And it was just such a nightmare. So um, for that, again, I just had to ride it out for eight months because I, I, I couldn't find a dermatologist that could help me. And then the way that I finally nipped this whole thing in the bud is um, three months ago, like in May, um, I was, uh, I put my hair up in a Dutch braid and I slept in it. And then the next morning I took the Dutch braid out and my scalp felt very tender and sore. Um, I had trichodynia, which was like the medical term for scalp pain. 
like tenderness on the scalp. And at first I thought it was from the braid, but the braid was very, very loose. So I'm thinking, wait a minute. Yeah. Cut my hair, the hair is kind of shedding, shedding. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. These are the same symptoms I had when the telogen effluvium happened the other two times. So I was like determined. So I said, dermatologist near me, Google. Luckily there was one right near my workplace. Uh, they kind of just recently opened and they were so savvy with hair loss. They were so good about it. They were all like new younger grads, like very open-minded, very, very, uh, you know, kind of like they were not dismissive at all about it. Like a very nice young man, dermatologist. He was uh, very sensitive to my case and he treated me right there on the spot. Like he did not let me leave without like a full arsenal of good treatment. And I thank God he had a beautiful head of red hair. I'll never forget it. He had the nicest hair. And he said, oh, my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend went through this condition. And, and uh, you know, so he was very sensitive towards it. And he was very helpful. And, like, I really have him to thank for, like, treating me because no one else wanted to treat me. Um, yeah. So basically, in my book, I, I tell what the exact treatment was. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that everyone is going to get the same exact treatment that I did, because like I, I have said, you have to be evaluated, you have to, you know, really see what's up with you and what is going on. But um, there are things that that can be done. Um, so now, um, just for maintenance, like now I just use like, you know, natural things. And luckily, um, everything is fine. I mean, it's normal to lose like some hair every day. Yeah, but, but if it's yeah. a large amount, that is concerning. Yeah. And I no longer have like the scalp pain, you know, or like those like tender areas or anything like that. Um, you know, and now I do know that if I ever woke up one day and I suddenly do have those symptoms again, like I know exactly what to do. Um, and I just want other women out there to know that there are things that can be done for them. And you don't have to dismiss it and you don't have to like have the wash day be such a terror because yeah. like for me wash days were like oh my gosh you know just terrifying and and you know what I, I have to say to this day like even though this happened to me like two years ago like you know the onset but to this day I am still traumatized <laughs> like I don't think it's ever something you fully get over mentally because like when you're losing your hair for almost a year you still kind of get a little bit nervous on wash day because you're like um is that gonna happen again yeah, you're, you know. you're like I don't know if I want to do that it can be scary I could imagine yeah. and like even just like brushing I'm always kind of like very slow and very like I, I I almost became like hyper aware of it so like even if like I comb and like if you come out I always get a little bit anxious because like I'm just so traumatized by all of it so that's why another reason I call it telogen effluvium warrior because like you we're in a battle you know it, uh, it's a battle to lose your hair and it's like a battle to kind of regain it and then heal from you know that trauma and I know it sounds silly to some people they just say oh it's just hair it's that's, hair. You know, it's, important. it's a big part of our identity you know in my opinion yeah, I mean, like I told my sister and she's like, oh, if if that's your biggest problem in life, I wish I was you because like, you know, as if to kind of, you know, minimize this problem as something so trivial, but it's really a huge, huge problem. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, like if you have like physical, visible like ball spots or something, like you're going to not feel comfortable going to work or going out on dates or going out in public and then you know, like to wear a wig is like not very comfortable, no. you know, and it's not really like a true solution. And people that like never experienced it, like they just don't get it. And for people that just um, don't realize like what an impact hair plays on people's self-esteem and happiness and confidence. And, you know, like it's more than just, oh, I'm having a bad hair day. Like this is literally my hair is on the carpet. My hair is in my food. My hair is in, in on the car seat like you know it's not on my head and, or it should be and I can you imagine know. if somebody was suffering from depression this would trigger worse symptoms correct? exactly exactly or or anxiety and they say that um, a lot of people like once this is cut the hair is falling and it's not stopping it then increases their anxiety and and you know anxious feelings and then that 
further causes it to shed more because now the stress hormone, you know, markers in their body are now going up and um, it just becomes like a vicious cycle. So um, it's just very important that, that women do get treatment for it and just not give up and just don't get dismissed left and right over and over without finding someone that will take you seriously because they are out there. There are people that can help you. Just like, don't give up. Just and make a nice list and maybe look for a young, I maybe people just out of school with the yeah. Not my yeah. Or like a practice that has like five or six different dermatologists, you know, within the same building that way, like, you know, maybe like one doesn't specialize in that that much, but maybe their colleague does. And then you're like, all right, I'll go to that one instead. Um, you know, which was the case for me because I went to like a practice that had like 10 different dermatologists. And then I finally went to one that was like super into it, which was great. That's good. I, I'm glad that when you keep looking, you're able to find a solution. Um, so it sounds like the reoccurring episodes, do you think those could continue like forever? Like, do you think absolutely? Love- yeah, absolutely. Like, um, you know, telogen effluvium can happen postpartum, you know, uh, and in that case, like postpartum, there's really nothing you can do about it. Like if you have a baby and, you know, the hormone shift and everything like that, you're just going to have to ride it out. But like that one is very self-resolving. But like if you wind up getting COVID again, for example, you can get reinfected with COVID if, if you get a reinfection. I've heard of some uh, women on the long hair community, actually, that wound up getting COVID a second time, and then they wound up losing their hair again a second time, like right. from the reinfection, yeah. um, which is also like a very big fear of mine, but I'm not, I'm no longer fearful of it anymore, because at least now I know exactly what I would do, Yes. you know, um, and I know that if it worked for me before, then it'll work for me again, so um you know, but at that time in the beginning, like when it first happened, I was like, what should I do? Like, should I just cut my hair off? Should I shave my head? And then some people did, like some people shaved their heads, like some people, you know, couldn't take just seeing their hair fall out. So they just completely buzzed it. And that was never like a thought on my mind, but there are some cases where people lose like that much and they just said, you know what, I'm just going to buzz it. Yeah, because they don't know what to do at that point, right? Yeah, no, I thought that was never an option for me. But, um, you know, I just, I just want people to know that, like, just don't panic, you know, you can panic a little bit, but don't panic too, too much, because you're not going to go completely bald, you know, and it will grow back. And, but you do have to be cognizant, like be aware of like the fact that you're susceptible to it. I mean, I know so many people that had COVID, and they did not experience hair fall and then I know some people who had asymptomatic COVID like they had like literally no symptoms and they wound up getting hair fall like from a positive COVID test so yeah. everyone is just so different um and I'm like so jealous of people that had COVID and that they didn't lose their hair because like you know for me like I had it and I just had, it was such a battle um you know it's just everyone is just so unique and that's why it's just so important to get get your blood work done get the scalp evaluation done and just look for um, autoimmune related markers in your blood, look for inflammation, like inflammatory levels in your blood, like C-reactive protein is a blood marker that can show inflammation in the body and um, have them check for autoimmune disease and things like that. You know, there's just so many different things, your vitamin D levels, um, make sure you're eating. You know, I know when I, when I had COVID, I didn't eat for three weeks just due to the illness and the appetite loss. And then obviously when you're not eating anything, then, you know, your body is being starved of nutrients. Is there any kind of like, um, supplement, like shake or bar you could eat if your appetite is suppressed due to COVID that they recommend? Like, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely um, think if you just don't have any appetite and you're and you're sick, um, I really like uh, fresh vegetable juices. Like um, you could do fresh orange juice, fresh carrot juice, um, different combinations of different fruits and vegetable juices that um, you can make at home or order them or what have you. Um, you can do like different, uh, soups. Like I was pretty much doing soup at that time just because like I, I had no appetite. 
Um, you can try uh, like different um, protein shakes, uh, you know, things like that. And those can all help keep your nutritional status going. Um, the protein shakes are especially helpful because they're giving you the amino acids, like, you know, the protein. Um, and there's different types of protein, like, you know, there's um, vegan type of proteins, like soy protein, pea protein. Um, then there's like um, the milk based protein, like the whey protein. Yeah, um, so like there's really something for, for everyone, for right. every dietary need. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's like, a, it's a tough thing. It's really not like a one size fits all. Research, experiment, figure out what's working. Yeah, yeah. Working. But I just, I just want women to know, like, just don't give up, you know, like, you'll be okay. Just don't get discouraged. Well, I, I think it's great. First off, I hope people do read your book and I'm going to put the link in the description. So hopefully some people. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm, like, I'm interested. Like, I want to take a look at it. So I think it will yeah. be helpful to women and men too, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's not a long read. It's, it's very short, straightforward to the point. It's not going to consume, you know, anyone's time too much, but it's just um, a good kind of like outline of like what to do first and then what to do for maintenance. And then you'll be fine. Like, you know, it's, it's very basic, very simple. Um, people have no attention span these days. <laughs> like they're just very like, you know, TikTok that you just kind of flip through, yeah. boom, 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 and, you I know, so, um, I don't want to waste, you know, people's time. I just want to help people. And I don't think you're wasting anybody's time. It sounds like it's very concise and well researched. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And all the products I recommend are they're all natural. Like nothing is, um, you know, chemical based or anything like that. And everything is um, has like a good track record and things like that. So. You know, it's it's really wonderful to know that there are things that can be done. Well, I think it's helpful. And also, too, as you said, do your research, get a list of derms that might specialize in hair loss, alopecia, correct? Is that the word that we're looking for? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and you know, some, some dermatologists are very kind of old school and they're just very set in stone and they're just like, okay, Unless you're presenting with like the patchy quarter size spot, you're pretty much out the door. And then there are some that are very just progressive, very savvy, and they're they're open minded. And they'll say, you know what, I'm willing to let you try this treatment just once. It, it won't hurt you to try it once. If it works, it works. We know. And if it doesn't, it doesn't, and you don't repeat it. Um, you know. So it's just very important to find one like that. And they are out there guys so just um you know it might take you uh, like a while it took me like a year or well, more than a year to really find my team so don't think that you know don't feel bad if like you strike out like the first one or two tries um it might also depend like on where you live like I live in New York City so um I have like a lot near me but then again it can be like a needle in the haystack because there's so many to choose from it makes it harder sometimes it makes it a little bit harder but um you know it, it also like I have health insurance I do realize that some people don't have health insurance so they might have to pay out of pocket um so if you do have to pay out of pocket just really make sure you you know you call them first and really just explain to them the condition, explain to them what you want to get done and find out like a breakdown, like how much is this going to cost? And, uh, you know, before you go ahead and, you know, spend your own money on, you know, someone that can't even help you, you want to make sure they can help you. Yeah, for sure. Do you think like, um, if somebody were to like go to a school of dermatology, because I know out, out here, I live near a university that's a teaching university. Yeah. So would that be a good um, maybe solution for somebody that's strapped for cash because they're still yeah, 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 absolutely. Like um, by me, we have um, NYU Dental School and a lot of my friends go there to get their dental work done at a very, very reduced cost. And, you know, usually, you know, something like what you're describing, you know, they're medical students and they're being supervised, you know, so anything that they, you know, prescribe you or give you for treatment is like, you know, under the supervision, you know, of, of someone above them. And I, I absolutely do recommend that if someone has that as an option near them, then absolutely. Um, because any type of 
professional opinion, you know, like we can't really see our scalp. Like we might look in the mirror and we think that we see our scalp, but we don't really see our scalp. No. Not the way that a trained medical eye can. Like when I went um, to this guy, I had no idea that I had scalp inflammation. He was like looking through and he was like, girl, your scalp is highly inflamed. And I was like, really? Like, I, I had no idea. <laughs> like, cause like to me, like I look at it and it looks okay. And apparently like he said it was highly inflamed and wow. it needed to get treated. And I'm wondering how many other people out there maybe have like, scalp inflammation that they don't know about or maybe they have um you know a fungal issue going on that they don't know about because even fungal issues can cause hair fall um they had prescribed me a ketoconazole shampoo that also had a fungal issue going wow. on that i wasn't fully aware of uh, again i had dandruff here and there from from time to time but it wasn't always like visible or evident all the time so i just kind of thought like I don't really need to um, use a medicated shampoo, but apparently I had that. So, you know, I'm wondering how many other women out there um, have like underlying scalp issues that they can't even see. Um, and even as just like a hair lover, it could be interesting to get the scalp evaluation done just for your own knowledge, just to kind of know like, hey, is my scalp really healthy? Because I do this, that, and the other thing, and I just want to know if it's working. It might make an interesting video for people in the hair community if they wanted to go just to see, you know, they might dip some issues in the bud, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I went on, because, you know, so many people use, like, these herbal products or these herbal shampoos or scalp treatments, and they say, oh, this treats this or this prevents that, but you don't really know if it is until you have a professional <laughs> evaluate you. You know what I'm saying? So um, that was a shocker for me, like an eye opener, because I certainly didn't think I had anything wrong with my scalp. <laughs> well, it yeah. makes sense, though, I guess, um, because hair grows out of the scalp. I wouldn't have thought of that, but I guess maybe a lot of people are dealing with inflamed scalp issues, perhaps. Right, right. Absolutely. And especially now that we're in, in summer, you know, you can get like uh, sunburns on your scalp and not really fully realize it. And then that can also cause inflammation as well. That's very interesting. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, they go crazy with the DIYs, like they're putting garlic on their head or they're putting, you know, food on their head and, you know, letting that brew and manifest. And then maybe the, some people don't always fully wash it out that good. And then that can lead to like the breeding of like fungus. And yeah. then they wind up getting like a fungal issue and then that can cause hair fall. So um, a lot of women, I'm not saying like, don't do any DIYs. Like in, in my book, I do have one DIY recipe just because I know that some people love their DIYs and yeah. people love to kind of be, you know, make a concoction in the kitchen and be proactive. So I do have one DIY recipe, but the rest are kind of like, you know, store-bought uh, things. Um, but I do see a lot of people putting bananas on their head or avocados on their head or, you know, coffee on their head or onion juice on their head and uh, mayonnaise on their head and, you know, all these things. And like, that can be fine, but it just has to be washed out really really well because you don't want that to breathe into like a fungal infection for sure and then opening up a host of of other issues oh gee <laughs> well it sounds like you want to be cautious and make sure if you're going to do these diys if you have a scalp issue it doesn't make it worse you know yeah yeah absolutely um and i know for me like when when my hair was really falling badly um i did stop coloring and dyeing it like thank god because like that really broke that, that bad habit that I had um but you just really don't want to do anything that's going to irritate your scalp and chemicals are very inflammatory and irritating you know those chemical hair dyes so you definitely don't want to do that um and I wasn't wearing any tight hairstyles I was more so just wearing it down or like in very loose braids because I'm trying to just like not put any traction or pressure on my scalp. Um, you know, and I was just trying to like let my scalp heal, you know, and just not put any more stress on it. That's 
really important, especially since I see in the hair a lot of really tight like hair cells that might make it worse. Or something yeah, like like those like high buns or like you know high ponytails and things like that. Like you know, for me that was just um, very irritating. Like when my scalp was in pain. So um, yeah, it's just. Uh, one of those things that you're going to have to do like a trial and error and just kind of see like how many days a week should I wash my hair? I mean, it's not a one size fits all. No. You know, some people say like, okay, wash it once a week, but maybe if you're dealing with a hair loss issue and you don't wash it all week and now you have that one wash day and lose like a thousand hairs, it's going to be very stressful. So if you're losing your hair, they say you should try to wash it a little bit more frequently. That way that one wash day doesn't like, completely make you faint you know yeah um yeah because otherwise it could just be too much to bear like at once but then again washing it a lot too is very stressful to day after day <laughs> be like oh my gosh like there it goes again so it's just really it's really difficult I mean that's why again it's anyone that that deals with this is a warrior because it really is like such a heart-wrenching like fight you know it's just it really is yeah, and I don't think we should, dis I, I mean, people are, have good intention, but I don't think we should dismiss people by saying, oh, it's just a little bit of hair loss, because that could really hurt somebody psychologically. We should be respectful of people's hair and what it means to them, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, like, when, when that one patient kind of po pointed out my bald spot, I was just like, oh my god, that means people can see it, and that means that other people probably saw it and then I began thinking who else saw it but they didn't tell me like you know like all these like thoughts are like running through your mind yeah or then I became kind of self-conscious to get my picture taken like from the back because I thought uh oh maybe they're gonna you know see that spot like from the back so I'm like you know combing it in such a way um you know luckily now it has all like resolved and grown back in like thank god hey. But, you know, I know that there are people that, um, you know, still are dealing with it. And it, it really is really, really painful. And I can understand why people wind up getting, you know, like um, a scarf to cover it or a wig or something, because like, it's, it's embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> like, Maybe they feel like that's the only solution, especially if they're just seeing old school dermatologists who's saying, oh, you'll be okay. Some people aren't knowing that they need to go out and get a second third fourth opinion and they might be like i just need to wear a wig or a scarf you know but yeah. i think you have your experience and your book that can help people see there is a solution or or the worst is when they just tell you to put some rogaine on it and get on with your life <laughs> you know i mean and i'm not bashing the product because i'm sure that you know it's helped many people yeah. out there it wouldn't still be on the market, I yeah, guess. No, I mean, it's FDA approved, but we have to keep in mind if somebody, like you said, has low blood pressure or other things that might trigger symptoms, that's concerning. We need to keep that in mind. Yeah. And also, like, if you have any type of heart issue, because, like, again, Rogaine is a vasodilator and it can also affect the heart as well. So it's just really something that you need to weigh out the pros and the cons and see how you react to it and really monitor your your symptoms and don't be afraid to throw it in the garbage like if you are really even slightly suspe suspecting you know that it is adversely affecting you um i've i've read some testimonials like on reddit like where some men and women were um, complaining that it was making their face look very sunken in and giving them very dark circles under their eyes and I did experience that as well Interesting. Um, yeah it was like really scary and I was like whoa if I'm going to maybe regrow my hair but have black sunken in eyes and a flaking scalp and horribly low blood pressure I'm not sure that it's worth it I mean I like hair but not at that not to that extent where I'm gonna compromise other uh you know aspects of my physiology just so I can have a full head of hair yeah. like there has to be another way you know um so you know it's definitely very individualized you know because if, if Rogaine does work for you then who am I you know I'm not going to say like stop it and don't use it because to each their own yeah, of course but you know it is something that uh, women 
do need to be aware of that it is a drug, it is a chemical, and it can possibly become systemic, despite what people might tell you, it can seep in. You know, our skin is the largest organ in our body. And, you know, if you really think about it, you wouldn't take like, let's say, a box of chemical hair dye, pour it all over your arm and sit there all day with it just marinating <laughs> through the skin of your arm and think that that's going to be good for you but people are doing that on their head yeah, putting on their head and we have a whole industry like i mean i know people love to get their hair colored and i'm not putting them down it's just but people do get bad reactions from hair dye often yeah. yes i mean i don't know if you've ever used um, a chemical hair dye before because um, your hair looks very virgin to me it's virgin but... i only do henna i yeah like 10 years ago, one time I did some highlights. I wasn't happy with the experience and I'm yeah. like, not me. I'm very much a natural kind of DIY, not extreme DIY, but I do more just like low end, like hair oiling, kind of occasionally. And that's about it. Yeah. Well, you're, you're very lucky because I was like on that bleach blonde bandwagon. And every time I got it done, I would come home with a severe migraine headache and I would always have to lay down the rest of the day, wow. you know, nursing, nursing my migraine, taking Tylenol with, with like, a, you know, a hot pack on my head due to pain. But I never made that connection, you know, stupidly enough because I was so obsessed with the blonde, you know, the fake blonde hair that I thought, okay, what's a little headache for a few hours as long as I have the hair color I want. And now, like, I would never do that again. But now, when you think about it, if all that chemical bleach and other stuff is sitting on your head for however long it's on for, every two months or every three months, not only is some of it seeping into your bloodstream, but you're also inhaling the fumes as well. Right. And, um, you know, I, I get it. Like, you know, some people just love a certain hair color, and it's completely up to the individual whether they feel that, the, you know, pros and cons or whatever, you know, are worth it to them. Um, but for me, like, having been through what I've been through and knowing what I know now, I would never go back to using any type of chemical dye or bleach or anything like that. Um, like, you know, I do occasionally do like henna treatments as well, um, just for the strengthening benefits and the conditioning benefits, um, you know, things like that. But you know, in terms of like any chemical dye, I would never do it again, ever. Yeah, I feel like it's just a little risky if you've had any kind of allergies to those products. That's just my opinion on it. But I get that people love to dye their hair. I'm not dismissing it. I just think maybe people should be careful. That's all. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that um, probably if you are going to do anything chemical related, the balayage is probably the safest one, which is where they take the bleach and they take like a paintbrush. And they just paint like ribbons of more the natural, color. Yeah. like more on the roots, so it never touches your scalp. It just stays on like your lengths, and then you know, ask them to kind of very carefully shampoo it out so it doesn't marinate like all over your scalp. Um, you know, so I have seen people get balayage done, and um, you know, they tend to have like less of a severe you know side effect than people getting it like all the way up onto their scalp. Um, but even that I just wouldn't do just because like hairdressers can be very rough. Mm -hmm. They can be very like, they have a mind of their own and they can just take really hot curlers and blow dryers and really just be very aggressive with how they dry it. Or when they wash, they might be very like, like, you know, scrubbing super, super hard or, you know, um, I'm just done with it. Like I just, I'm more like you now, like, you know, just do everything yourself at home and don't be bothered with, you know, having them do it. Um, I really enjoy your Instagram and your hairstyles are so beautiful. I think that you're looking really great, like with what you're doing. So. Oh, thank you so much. And you, you are just like the hair queen. Like I am just so amazed by, you know, your whole hair journey as well. It's just it's incredible. Yeah. I've done a couple things. I'm, changing it like I would never mix henna with conditioners that was a mistake a bad recommendation that they have on the internet by the way oh my gosh yeah yeah, yeah. I've talked and about that I, and I wasn't like really aware of that like 
you know, before. So that's also interesting. <laughs> well, some people are okay when they do that, but I have yeah. a concern because they're just going on the internet and they're like saying, oh, you can just, this is a fast way to do henna, but it created like a big tangle in my hair. And I, for a week, I tried to get it out and it would not budge. So I, I have concerns. If it's okay for some people, that's fine. But I would just say, be very cautious if you're going to do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of things, unfortunately, are like a trial and error type of thing. Um, you know, even even with something as simple as hair combing and brushing, like they're, like in the beginning, when I first joined the long hair community, they were saying, do not ever use like a plastic comb. They were saying only use like a wooden comb or a wooden brush. Mm -hmm. So of course, the first thing I did, I go on Amazon, I order that wooden brush. And then, first of all, like, it was so big and heavy and cumbersome. And I just felt like for me, it was not a match, you know what I'm saying? And like, for me, I, I actually preferred like, you know, a, a plastic wide tooth comb. Like for me, that was better. That's um, I always used to be honest with you. I like the plastic comb, but I guess some people prefer the wooden ones. Right. But it's just so easy to kind of, you know, think that like, oh, well, I must switch to this, that, or the other thing, because this is what they say, mm -hmm. you know, and then like, you try it, and you're like, oh, my God, like, why did I get this? This is horrible, you know, so it's really, I guess that's why they call it a hair journey, because it really is like a journey, it's just going to be ups and downs, you know, trials and errors, bumps in the road, live and learn experiences, and then eventually, <laughs> you know, after a period of time, you kind of um, keep the things that work for you and throw out the things that didn't. And you just kind of learn to, um, you know, experiment open-mindedly, but um, at the same time, if it works for you, then don't worry about it, it works. But I am glad that you are recommending, like if there's an issue with your scalp to get a you know, second, third, fourth opinion with a dermatologist. So I think that's another angle that is good because there's some other actually YouTubers that have mentioned before that they had Pilar cysts on their scalp. Right. And they were saying, oh, I'm just going to try these natural things from Etsy, but the products that they tried made it worse. So um, actually naturally Antonia, she said it didn't get better until she got a second opinion with her doctor. So sometimes yeah. it's good to get a medical opinion. I mean, I love the natural route, but I also do think you should get some sort of second, third opinion if it's not resolving with these natural products. Yes, 100%, absolutely. And that was also my dilemma as well, is um, when it first started happening, I was like, all right, I'm going to eat my greens. I'm going to drink my juices. I'm going to put some coconut oil on my ends and take my biotin and I will fight this and I will be good and like little did I know that those weren't doing like a darn thing for it and you know I wound up spending a lot of money I tried um PRP which I don't know if you've ever heard of PRP but it's platelet rich plasma oh. they're injections so basically you would go to like a med spa or a dermatologist and they take um you know some of your blood and then they put it through a centrifuge so it like spins really really fast and then it separates your you know like the red part of your blood like from the yellow like the plasma and then they inject just your own plasma into your scalp all throughout very very expensive um it's anywhere from 600 to like 1200 per session but again, I was so desperate. I went on Groupon and I found like a coupon, you know, for a place and I was getting it done. And I went like maybe three, three, four times, something like that. It did nothing. Like it did not stop the, the problem at all. Um, you know, and maybe for some people with other types of hair loss, like maybe if you have like androgenetic alopecia, like the more of like the male or female pattern, hormonal type of hair loss, maybe that works more for that. But if you have telogen effluvium, which is like a post illness or post viral or stress related, then the PRP really did not do anything. So I would say if you have telogen effluvium and you're thinking about getting PRP, save your money because it is very expensive. Insurance does not cover it and it does not stop the condition. Wow. Um, so that's another thing, like I live and learn, <laughs> like, you know, I spent so much money did not know it wouldn't help me. Um, the laser helmet too. Um, 
laser helmets are not cheap. Like the Eye Restore laser helmet. I saw um, Dr. Dre. She's like a dermatologist on YouTube. Yeah, video. So she highly preaches the Eye Restore laser helmet. And first thing I did, I got it. I found it on eBay for like $400 and I was using it. And they say to use it only three times a week, but being the dedicated person that I am, I used it daily <laughs> because, you know, I was just so OCD about it. And um, for like the first three weeks, like I didn't really see anything, like no change, good or bad. And then after about three weeks, um, I woke up in the morning, I went to the sink and I put my head down and lifted my head up and like a bunch of my hair was just like in the sink. I was like, <gasps> like, I, like I almost fainted from like, the, the shock of seeing how much hair came out wow. and and a lot of the hairs were not even like my my longer they're more of like my shorter ones oh, like wow like just going in just going in and they were like coming out so my theory is that the helmet um was like restarting like I guess like a new cycle if that makes any sense and just kind of pushing out you know some hairs to make room for new ones and but it was like all at once. And so that day I put my helmet on eBay and I sold it because I was like, oh, I can't use this anymore because I mean, maybe if I stuck it out and wrote it out, you know, eventually the cycle would have evened itself out. But because I was losing my hair to begin with, I didn't want to, you know, test that theory and go in that direction. Yeah, I don't think, and I've actually read some similar reviews with people saying like some people have had good experiences, but I've read a few where people said they lost hair due to the helmet. So it's good to keep that in mind. You know? Yeah, yeah, just kind of save your money, go to a dermatologist and, you know, like have them really give you treatment. And then, you know, once you're stabilized, you know, try some of the, you know, natural as well as over the counter stuff, like from, from the book that I suggest, um, you know, like a little preview, like they're nothing, they're nothing too special. They're more like, um, some of the products are from like the innate life, like, which is awesome. a very well-known company among the natural hair community. Um, some products from that uh, company called Keratin, like they also have some really good products. Um, in addition to some DIYs using essential oils, because um, now a lot of studies are showing that rosemary is actually a great natural alternative to minoxidil, like a, a drug-free minoxidil. It's been studied, actually, where they've done like the side-by-side -side comparison where one group got rosemary and then another group got minoxidil, and they found that the results were pretty much the same, um, except that the rosemary users had like no side effects and the monoxidil group had like a bunch of side effects. Um, so now there's like all these recipes, like DIYs for rosemary water, rosemary oil. Um, there are some companies like um, Miel, I think M-I-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, that sells like a rosemary based um, hair oil. Um, that's like really cheap. Like you get on Amazon for like $8, um, you know, if you're on a budget. So there's definitely um, all, like more natural or alternatives to help, um, you know, hair regrowth. So women don't have to poison themselves, <laughs> you know, or go broke <laughs> with these yeah. like kinds of things that don't even work, you know. That's a good. I mean, a lot of a lot of companies are just out to make make a buck, you know. And um, um, yeah, definitely. Like with all the pro we have to be careful these days, you know. Yeah, and to go to a dermatologist is essentially free. I mean, as long as you have health insurance, it's not going to cost you anything. So a lot of companies they don't want you to know that because you know then you're not going to buy their laser helmet, <laughs> you know. Or try their, I don't know, whatever type of concoction. So Right, exactly. Or try their $80 oil or something like that, you know. So, yeah, no, definitely. Ladies, go to a dermatologist, please. But, you know, be careful at the same time. Find a good one. <laughs> well, I really appreciate all your wealth of information and just the journey and how new COVID is. We don't really know much about it. So it's so interesting to realize this is it could be a side effect of COVID, especially if it's asymptomatic COVID. That's something I never thought about, actually. And and from this. And that is what I've been thinking about too, because like I said, um, I didn't have a, an extreme amount of hair loss, but I noticed a little bit. I'm like, that's weird, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's like kind of like the other um, kind of like taboo, you know, topic because, you know, it's like people are so scared to 
talk about it, but um, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a reality, you know, and it's just something that um, women, you know, need to be aware of. And like, you know, I'm not telling women like, oh, okay, like, don't, don't get this just because of, of this. Like, you know, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying, be aware that if it does happen, don't worry, you can do something. Yeah. You know, no, it's good to know, though, I, it's information and maybe that happens to someone and they are they don't know why and that they're able to make the connection by reading your book or watching this video and then reading your book, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I'm so excited to have you on and maybe if later in a few months you want to give us an update, I would be really excited to have you come on again and yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was so fun. It was such a pleasure. And yeah, I would love to, I would be honored to come back sometime and just update you on what I've been doing and how the hair is growing back in and, you know, things like that. Absolutely. That is so wonderful. And um, I will definitely link to the book and your Instagram and we'll continue watching your story because I think it's really great to know there is a solution and people don't have to just go with the first opinion they can get a second third and fourth so yes yes absolutely absolutely thank you so much julia oh Such no a... <laughs> yeah it was great and i hope you have a wonderful day rita yeah you too you too enjoy your sunday bye bye